Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Haley. Good morning, Dan. Happy weekend. <laughs> Did you enjoy the snow that we got right at the end of this week? I mean, it's very pretty, but it's, it's February- not the time of year that I really love snow. Well, right. And yeah, it's February, so we should expect it. It's Michigan, but this always gets you when you get that nice weather. Yeah. And then any snow comes. No, no. I no, was and then all you're over just it. livid. Like, right. <laughs> why are you doing this well, to me? <laughs> and my big thing is that, you know, Repcolite has been very kind and I've got this work truck, mm-hmm. but I'm a, a small person and I, cleaning the snow off of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I need a ladder. <laughs> I need scaffolding in order to do it. You're listening to the Repcolite Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And on the show today, Haley, all kinds of stuff pros and cons of solvent thin products. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing because we're going to bring our A game to that yeah. and take a topic that might induce almost death-like comas and we're going to fill it with excitement. I mean, it does contain spontaneous combustion. Right. We yes. do talk about that. So hang so. around for that. Spontaneous <laughs> combustion in the last segment. We'll also be talking about how the wrong footwear can change your interior design. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited about that. We'll be talking about drills and drivers, uh, impact drivers, drills. Where do you use one? Where do you use the other? Right. There what about all the strengths, all the functions that you're probably not using on them? Exactly. Haley is going to regale us with her information and knowledge. Yes. That's coming up next. But right now, for this little bit that we've got, let's talk about Haley's air purifier that we talked about last week. Yes, I'm very excited because I feel like my influencer level, I've gone up a notch. Because this time, I only talked about it once, and it was maybe five minutes, Right, and you bought one. This is the second time Haley's talked about something that, well, maybe even more than that, but I I ran out and got one. Her her talking about it so compelled me, and it sounded so good, so I bought one. Uh, It's a Kenmore PM 2010 air purifier. I'll put a link in the show notes. It'll clean air up to like 1,200 square feet or so. Right. And it only takes about the same amount of energy as a light bulb to run the thing. So it runs all the time, but you're only using that tiny little bit of energy. It's Energy Star rated, which is really nice. But my favorite part of it that we talked about is that it has this digital readout that tells you what the air quality is in the room, whether it's good, bad, fair, you yep, know. gives you a little rating, a scale, a number, and then a scale to check it against. Right. And when Haley talked about hers, she turned it on, and it was 53 or 56, and it was borderline poor. Right. And I made huge jokes about that because I thought that was hilarious that her air quality was so bad. Mine came. <laughs> I plugged it in. Haley's was 56. Yeah. Mine was 135. <laughs> We can't even see from one side of the room to the other when, you know. It's crazy. I don't know what's going on, but it's been running for a week, and I thought I'd talk about it very quickly just because it's funny. We've only got about a minute left. Here's what I found. Everybody in the house says the air feels cleaner. Yeah. We don't know if that's just placebo effect, but I'm going to take it because I can live with a I'm placebo effect. i it's real. Yeah. Um, I've noticed a decrease in dust. I've got to check that a little more thoroughly, but it seems sure. like that's happening when we cook. I've noticed the smells don't linger, and here's why I'm rushing. I want to get to the funniest proof of all of this that really makes it make sense. I've got a black lab. She's about two years old, and she's... She has internal problems. Sure. She'll make the wind, She's and it's very smelly. Gassy. She's a little yeah. gassy. And she did that, and it just fills the whole room. And everybody knows Fern <laughs> has done this thing. She was sitting by the air purifier, and yeah. it happened. The numbers went flying through the roof, <laughs> but the smell was immediately dispelled. Wow. We yeah, gotta, that's pretty nice. Yes. That's She's, pretty nice. She's got to take up residence <laughs> by this thing. I'll put a link in the show notes. I think it's worth checking out. Definitely look into it. All right. We're going to take a break. Yeah. You're going to want to get your drill or your drivers or whatever you've got. Get them ready. Yeah, because we're going to talk about all the things that are on those that you're probably not using. You're going to need them for a visual aid. Yes. So get those and we'll be back in just a minute. Stick around. Well, Haley, I grabbed the tool that we told everybody to get. I've got my impact driver here. Yes. If you did not hear that last segment. We're telling you all to get out your drills or impact drivers because we're going to go over some specific functions that we might not all be using. Right. You're going to want to have the tool in front of you because even I, even I (laughs) was unable to recall with certainty all the different features that are on my drill. Yeah, I'm pitching this topic and 
the first thing that we're going to talk about is this little switch that's on the top of your that drill. That I didn't think I had. <laughs> it's either got a one or a two on it. Dan's convinced his drill does not have this. Turns out Dan was wrong. It's one of these <laughs> rare instances. Anyway, you're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, and Haley's going to walk us through a whole drill driver versus an impact driver mm-hmm. uh, segment. We're yes. going to talk about drill drivers, so basically battery-powered, your electric drills, making holes, but most of those are also, they'll double drivers, as drivers. You right, drive screws you can, or fasteners. Exactly. And then there's an impact driver, which is a little different. looks similar, makes a real ratchety loud sound, sounds like a little machine gun sometimes. Yeah. That's um, a good way to describe it. Yeah, they're great tools. Both of them have different purposes, and a lot of times they kind of get used interchangeably sometimes. Yes, I think that they can be used interchangeably, and they're not always the best when they're used outside of what they're really intended for. Right. And this is a big pet peeve of Haley's. In fact, it's a big pet peeve of your husband's. It is. I think that it's a bigger pet peeve of his, and now I have maybe adopted it. All right. So we're going to talk about it. Let's walk you through it. Where do we got to start with this, Haley? So that little switch. So we're looking at a drill driver here. Yes. We're going to get to impact drivers in a minute. So look at the tool that you brought. If you had both, grab the drill driver. It's got that little switch on the top that just flips back and forth, and it's either a one or a two. So the setting one is for a low speed, and it's high torque, and it's best for driving screws. You want to use setting two for higher speed, and it's really meant for drilling, but you can still use it when you're driving fasteners. And honestly, I think I always have my drill on the number two setting, which this is, is not necessarily ideal. No, this is that switch I didn't even know existed. Exactly. <laughs> so yes, mine is always on two. It's always on max because yeah. I live my life on max. Yeah, you're extreme. I am extreme <laughs> in everything I do, even my drilling. Yes. All right. So that's one setting. Pay attention to that. One is low speed, high torque. Setting two is a higher speed setting, and you probably want to use that for drilling. Yes. So that's the little switch on top. Right. Now let's talk about this little dial here. Right. That's your clutch setting. And (laughs) Dan can't get enough. This is like, this is what ASMR for tools. Well, yes. Well, it's very pleasing to do. So (laughs) it's the little collar with all the numbers on it. Yes, that's exactly. So that's the clutch. And we want to make sure we get this right. This is a very important setting because ultimately the main role of the clutch is to control the driving force of the drill bits or the screws. So we're really talking about torque here, and that's the force that's being applied, the pressure that's mm-hmm. being applied. And it works alongside speed. So while the speed controls how quick that rotation is, the torque is controlling how much pressure is used. So adjusting the clutch based on what you're doing is going to allow you to be more precise, which is really, I think, the strength of a drill is just the precision that you can get. And if you've got something where you can move faster, you can tweak that, and that will allow you to move a little faster. It's going to help you avoid damaging materials or fasteners. Yeah. How many times don't we strip something out? True. And the... This clutch setting would help us avoid that. Or, you know, if you're drilling into a softer material like drywall, you really don't need that much torque or that much pressure to get through the material. No, you don't need it. But sometimes it's just fun to have. Yeah, except that you could ultimately damage the surface, right? I mean, it really doesn't take that much to get through the paper on the drywall, and then that can cause a lot of problems. I guess, yes. Um, I have short person syndrome. So I do like to have as much power as possible. I don't even know what short person syndrome is, but I'm probably short enough to probably have it if it exists. (laughs) So anyway, we're back to the drywall. You don't, you know, you don't need all that power. The torque or the clutch setting is going to help you dial it in. Right. So you're not driving those screws too far past the face paper or But then there's the other side of this, you know, because if you're drilling through something like tile or, you know, a hard material or knotty wood or something where you need more power you really want to use a slower speed. So all these things work together, right? Because if you're not doing that, if you're going at a really high pressure, high speed with a hard material, you're going to end up overheating that drill bit and you can ultimately damage the bit and your drill. So again, these settings can really protect us from damaging our tools and And, the materials. And getting the most out of them and getting the best results. So how do you dial the clutch in on the drill? Pretty basic. So you can see those numbers on it, you know, from 1 to 10 or sometimes 1 to 20. Um, But 
you want to set it to a range that you kind of think is going to get you close. So if it's a softer material, a lower number. If it's a harder material, you're going to want a higher number. Or if it's a longer fastener, a higher number, a shorter fastener, a lower number. And you can get it kind of close. You can get it really dialed in by, you know, testing that essentially and then adjusting it if you're either not getting enough force to get you into the material or if you've got too much where you're going, you know, and countersinking that material a little bit. You can kind of adjust it forward or backward, Basically, get it into that sweet looking spot. looking for the sweet spot, the yeah. butter zone, butter zone to get the best results. Yes. So use that clutch setting. If you don't, and I, I would say I do that on a regular basis. My problem is that I will set it and it's not because <laughs> I'm drilling first yeah. and I'll have to keep raising it up and then I'll make the switch to fastening and driving the fastener and that's when I forget to dial it back down. And then you're... Oh, yeah, then I things. then I drive it in too far. Yeah. Then I make the adjustment. Yeah, I've started to work on other people's things first, <laughs> and then transition to my own stuff. So you have to I be can, consistent yeah. with using them. You can't use it and then forget to use it. <laughs> All right. So there, that's the drill driver. There's a number of little settings, things to be aware of. Right. Well, let's go to impact drivers now. When would I use an impact driver instead of a drill? So Haley, impact drivers. Teach us are really better for things where you need a lot of force or you're using a long fastener, like a three inch wood screw, or you're going into like a really stubborn material with a lot of knots in it or something like that. And I think it works through those things. Just it's like butter, like yeah. back to the butter zone. It makes it just, a lot of noise. so quick and easy. <laughs> it, it, the first time I used them, uh, they make so much noise, yeah. uh, ratcheting a machine gunny sound. Right. And I thought clearly... I have broken this tool. It was not mine at that point. But no, that's just part of the magic. And they that's are awesome. amazing tools for those situations. Well, Driving I think long they can screws, long seem fasteners. like a superior tool because of that. I because so. they're able to go through things so much quicker. But I think there is still, you know, a need for both. And the main difference between a drill and an impact driver kind of boils down to that power and the rotational action. So unlike drills, an impact driver has a quick release shank. You know, first of all, you're using a different drill bit on an impact driver. Mm -hmm. It's always going to have that little hex driver bit that you've got to attach to it. You can't just use your drill bits with this. Nope. Nope. But you can buy drill bits with that hex shank and yes. they're wonderful in your in your impact driver. That's true. No keyless chuck. Even a keyless chuck, which sounds so great yeah. on a drill driver. Oh, I sure do love that quick release thing. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. So impact drivers use a lot of rotational force, like I mentioned, and they're capable of driving those really long wood screws in just seconds. But that's because they've got this internal mechanism that allows impact drivers to produce more torque than drills and in really quick bursts. So those bursts or impacts, they happen like 50 times in a second, which is what that machine gun sound is yeah. that you're hearing. <laughs> I did not know this is what's going on. So. They do that and they're rotating their bits in a two-step process. It's like two steps forward and then one step back pattern. Which is exactly how I do <laughs> all of my projects. So I really do need to have an impact driver yeah. for them because it really just It, it marries. marries perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> You're very compatible in that way. I am. Yeah, it's a great relationship. <laughs> but they're engaging in driving screws uh, more effectively in that w way. When you say a two-step, so it, so it spins it two steps one way. Back the other way, and then back, 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 right, back, back. Right, exactly. Which I almost just made the sound. That's what it sounds like. Back, 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 back. <laughs> Maybe that's what it's saying. <laughs> so anyway, it will drive stuff like it's driving it through butter. It's great. Yes. But you do need to be careful because you want to be driving through kind of more rough construction kind of materials than finished stuff. Right. I mean, it's a really great tool if you're doing something like a deck or you're doing flooring or roofing. You know, if you're putting up a fence, it just really big projects where you don't need to be super precise and you're, you know, consistently driving really long fasteners over mm -hmm. and over and over again, where it would be really time consuming to use a drill where you've got a pre-drill and then drive your fastener yep. every single time. Right. That can With be a pain. With this, you can just use the impact driver. Or you can get those little little hex shank um, driver bits. Yeah, you, you can, can swap them drill. back and forth yeah. really fast if you do need to pre-drill because sometimes that is still required. Yes. All right. So true. with that all said, the impact driver, 
Still sounds pretty superior to me. It looks like it's wearing, wearing the superhero cape and the and the superhero outfit. Well, there are times, though, when you really need a drill over an impact driver. So, like, when you're using really short fasteners, that's a perfect example. I mean, you talked about You looked at how... me when you said short. I noticed that. <laughs> and you pointed. Well, we are having a conversation. So, oh. if I looked away, would that be better? <laughs> okay. So, that wasn't a short joke. <laughs> See? Every time I say short, I have an issue. I'll just avert my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but then I'll feel like you just can't stand the, the sight of me. <gasps> my shortness is just hideous. <laughs> I think I'm average size. You're average. You I are. can reach the top Truly. shelf of the fridge. I think we should look that up. I think you are average. All right. Uh, <laughs> is all that right. better? <laughs> that's average. I mean, that's good. Yes, I can live with that. So if I'm driving average size screws, yeah. short fasteners, things like that, <laughs> I'm going to want to use the drill driver right. because I can be more precise. I can dial it in. Exactly. I can be gentler on the materials that right. I'm using. It's those... really easy to just overdo it with an impact driver when you're not working with something like a three-inch wood screw where you need that torque and that power. Yes, I have overdone it. I made some cl- uh, lamps for a an event that we had, and I made them out of oak. Mm-hmm. It's one of the few times I was making something that was going to be like it was the finished wood, and it was right. going to be stained and varnished, yeah, and not covered over with paint and a bunch of spackle. And so I was being very careful, and I was did an absolutely beautiful job with mm-hmm. these. But then I hit a point where, yep, using my impact driver, drove this you know the the fastener too far in this one little area, and then ended up splitting out. A bunch of wood. Yep, it's classic. I mean, drills are nice because they have all of those safety nets for you that don't allow you to do that when you've got it set correctly. Right. And to be fair, my impact driver is variable speed. Most of them are. And I was being very careful with my trigger finger, Mm -hmm. but it is my trigger finger and it is pretty itchy. And I hit it too hard. So, yes, the drill driver has the safety net to keep you safe. Right. And, you know, if you're drilling holes, you can, like you said, use your impact driver. However, again, if you want to be more precise, if the size and the roundness of that hole is really crucial, you still, you just don't want to use an impact driver. The roundness of the hole is impacted in what regard? So because of that, I sort of think of the impact driver as having like a little bit of a hammering action to it. Two steps forward, the one step back. Yeah. It's going to sometimes either blow the material out the backside in a way that is not going <laughs> to produce pretty results, but it also on certain blo- how, how many times like do you forms blow the material you out the backside and produce beautiful results? <laughs> Never. Okay, well, let's yeah. just leave it there. No. So that's an impact driver. Right. The drill will give you a better, rounder Cleaner, opening that you're creating. Right, because it... It's not doing that action that we talked about. Yeah, it's not about. the two steps forward and the one step back. It's right. only forward. That's how Haley does projects. <laughs> only forward. Only forward. No, well, and I you wish. can reverse it. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. That's a rabbit hole. We don't need to go down. No. There's a right and a wrong, and you can get good results with both. Yeah, because I honestly, like I was reading forms with contractors that are saying the difference in roundness between an impact driver and a drill is so minimal that most people would still just use an impact driver. But if you are a Finnish worker, I think you'd probably opt for a drill. Well, I think it's just fun to know. Yeah. I can disregard that information <laughs> as I feel inclined to do so. <laughs> Or and just pick other people. Right. Yeah. But at least I know. Right. I'm that much smarter now, that much more annoying mm-hmm. in a, you know, gathering of people. I've got something I can pull out of my pocket and throw on the table. And now all of you listening have that same little item. Yes. So bring that out at the next party. All right. We're <laughs> going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about how the wrong footwear can get you off on the right foot <laughs> with your interior design. I like what you did there. That's all next. Stick around. Well, Haley, we've made a lot of big claims in the show that we're going to talk about footwear, the wrong footwear, and I made a really smart, a punny little statement. You did. It was nice. At the end of last segment, how how we're going to talk about how the wrong footwear can get you off on the right foot in your interior design. Do you see what I'm doing I'm there? glad that you repeated it. Well, it was so brilliant, <laughs> it needed repetition. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. Let's talk about... How the wrong footwear gets us off on the right foot. Yes. So it's the wrong shoe theory that we're talking about. 
uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. Basically, it's intentionally selecting shoes that clash with the outfit. Intentionally. Yes, That's an important part. A lot of us have done this <laughs> unintentionally. <laughs> right. Yes, and it kind of works, but it's not really that. leaning into this theory so much. So what is the theory in fashion? I mean, I get it. So Let's it's talk this about thing it's that cool. really took off. It, I think it's like a TikTok thing, mm-hmm. honestly, that is just kind of blown up. The kids up. love the TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> but it's this theory that by adding, you know, a shoe to the outfit that doesn't match it. So let's say you're wearing a dress and you pair it with like a Doc Martin boot mm-hmm. or you're wearing something really casual and you wear high heels or like a dress shoe instead of a casual shoe. That contrast kind of automatically makes the outfit more eye-catching, more interesting, adds more personality to it. And so now people are saying that, well, this applies to interior design, not just fashion. Right. And I really like that concept because it ties into so many things that we've talked about Mm -hmm. going all the way back to, I mean, years back where we talked about Iris Apfel. Right. Yeah, I thought about her right away. Just how fashion, you know, how what's happening in the world of fashion, which really doesn't, I don't care about so much, but yet how I can take some of those elements and apply them in another area where I do care a little more. And I just love this idea. So how do we take this wrong shoe theory and just make it practical in in terms of interior. Well, I think, you know, the the core of this idea is really just the idea of using juxtaposition, so contrast basically in your design creating focal points by having something that really stands out against whatever else is going on in the room. So, an easy example when you're thinking about interior design and using this would be, okay, let's say you have a really traditional space and now you're adding a piece of pop art to that room where it's a really high contrast to the style you've got going on, Mm -hmm. but it creates this focal point or the wrong shoe in the space that adds that personality and that really kind of unique eye-catching feature. Oh, yeah. And that's where it's so much fun because here's where you really can lean into, you know, I think a few weeks ago we talked with Andy Yates yeah, and he talked about the importance of bringing in, you know, what you personally love, the Mm -hmm. things that really speak to you. And this is a way to do that if yeah, you're a little you bit a nuts. Lot of freedom. Yeah. Well, right, because if if you're the things that personally speak to you are way <laughs> out there, you <laughs> can sneak perfect. them in, right, and look like you're right on trend here. I, I think of my sister who's got one of those 1950s cat clocks with the eyes oh, that sure. go back yeah, and forth. Yeah, the back tail. Forth. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really fit with anything in the way she's put her house together. <laughs> she loves it. It really speaks to her. But it's that element yeah, it's that really shoe. sets off the room or the space. Right. Well, and I think it applies. Going back to Andy Yates again, we talked about how right now layering different time periods is really trending. So he talked about people layering, you know, things from the Victorian era where you've got all this really ornate design, but then adding elements from the 80s in on top of that, which is a really stark contrast. But it feeds right into that wrong shoe theory where you've got this really high contrast element that just creates a focal point in the room, essentially. So many interesting ways that that could be pulled off. You know, mid-century modern, you know, something Mm -hmm. sleek and a lot of clean lines. And then adding in something ornate. You know, you were going the other direction, but that's another way to do it. Absolutely. It could be done with colors. Yes. I mean, we just talked about complementary color schemes, and that's exactly what makes that work, too, is that really high contrast visual that adds that really dynamic um, design feature. Right. And I would think it's not going to be just, what do you think about this? It's not just the element. It could also be a location. I mean, we've talked about Mm, putting color on a Mm -hmm. ceiling. We just put something on our Instagram page from one of our painting contractors who has wallpaper. You know, they did a project where they wallpapered a ceiling. And just how cool that looked. It, yeah. It's, it's, no, it's a good out point. of what you were thinking. It's I don't know if it's the wrong shoe, but it definitely is I think in the it wrong feeds spot. Into it. Yeah, it's it not where like. we're expecting it to be. Even I think scale could play into this too. If it's a rug that's not necessarily the right size for the room or a piece of art that is maybe too small for the wall that it's on, where it's on the wall, I think that it's it's technically wrong, <laughs> but I think because of that, it adds this really unique kind of eye-catching thing. I think there's a lot going on. I think it's a lot of fun. I think mm-hmm. it gives you the opportunity to dabble. Yeah, you can experiment. But but it doesn't mean you're going to get it right all the time. Just because you've added the wrong shoe <laughs> right. doesn't mean it looks good with the outfit, right? Because yeah. it can still be a, a big failure, and that's okay. 
You well, just take it down and put it back in the closet yeah. and get something new out on that People space. People have latched onto it because it's new. And just because something is new, it doesn't mean it's necessarily a good thing. But I think it's really interesting and could be fun to experiment with. I think it could be a lot of fun with color, yeah. with different styles, different eras, all these different things you can pull in. Mm-hmm. Now, Haley, the wrongest shoe in your home. Where have you used the this? Wrong. Is there anything that, think, that yeah, comes to mind? Yeah, my living room, I would say, mostly has kind of modern-ish, um, more like mid-century modern pieces of furniture. But there's one side table that is very Victorian. It's got a lot of like ornate sure. carving on it. And it works really well in that room because it is the wrong shoe. All right. So there you go. We've got more we'll say about it. I'm sure we're going to revisit this. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. It's a big topic, and I think there's a lot more to say, but we don't have much more time for this segment. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking about the pros and cons of solvent-thin coatings. We're going to end with a bang. Yes. (laughs) Because, in fact, we're going to be talking about spontaneous combustion. So, really, we might end with a bang. Stay tuned to find out. Well, Haley, are you ready for the big conclusion, the finale of the Recolite <laughs> Home Improvement Show for the Makes week? Does it sound like there's the going to be... Oh, Yeah, it's not the end of the show for... Yeah. <laughs> five people are cheering and the rest are groaning. Oh, we thought it was over. No, are you ready for the big finale, the big last segment, the one with where we pull out all the stops, the one with the dance number and the singing? Always, always ready for the dance number. Always ready. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. Let's talk about traditional solvent thin coatings, because that sounds <laughs> so exciting on a Saturday morning, right? All I can think about right now is the fact that I was just so disappointed. I I watched the new Willy Wonka. Yeah. You know the one with Timothy Chalamet. Yes. Char- yeah. yeah. I don't know how to <laughs> that say guy. it. Uh, I don't know what I thought. It was going to be. I know that Willy Wonka is essentially a musical. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I did not think that that was going to be a musical. (laughs) That's very interesting. (laughs) And so when it started, I was immediately so disappointed. Really? That's funny because we looked at it and I thought about renting it. Yeah, I did. And it's so expensive to rent. And then I was just so disappointed. And the kids told me, Dad... It's a musical. Just understand that. And I said, I know. Of course it's a musical. I expect nothing less. Right. It's Willy Wonka. Yeah. Yeah. They said, no, there's a lot of people who are like really disappointed and shocked to find out it's a musical. So you're one of them. The marketing for it made it seem like it was going to be this grittier version of Willy Wonka. (laughs) Where all the children don't survive this time. I mean, it's pretty dark. I mean, it 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 is is. dark. (laughs) Haley wanted the NC-17 uh, version of I don't Willy know Wonka. what I expected. Yeah. Anyways. We don't know what's in the chocolate in that one. <laughs> Little ground up pieces of Augustus Gloop or whatever. Anyway, that is not what we're going to no, talk about, but we did. About. Let's talk about traditional solvent-thin coatings. Yes. They are Let's. harder and harder to find. Basically, what I'm getting at are oil-based products. Yes. You know, that's what we're referring to here. The best way to refer to them is solvent-thin, so I will. But just so we're all talking about the same thing. They're harder and harder to find because Michigan's new VOC regulations pretty much regulated them right out of existence. Right, exactly. Um, They've been reformulated dramatically now in order to fit within those regulations. But a lot of those formulation changes have kind of affected the products in a really poor way. Like well, yeah. The application they, characteristics are just not as nice anymore. Right. Now, we talk about this a lot. We've talked about it since it happened back in April of last year. Mm-hmm. But it's a big deal. It is a big deal. And the reason we keep talking about it is because the law is written to allow small manufacturers like Repcolite an extra five years before we have to have those new formulations in place. We still need to do that and reformulate right. our stuff if we want to continue selling it in Michigan. But we don't have to have those formulations ready to go for another three or four years. So right now, we're really unique in Michigan in that we can have these products. We are one of the few places that you can actually find traditional coatings and buy them in the form that you're used to working with. Right. So if you're a painting contractor or a DIYer who had a favorite solvent-thin product that you no longer can purchase in Michigan, we most likely have an alternative that will function just the way the old one did. Which is why we want to talk about it so much. Yeah, so stop (laughs) out and talk to us. We can help you. But... After saying all of that, a lot of people listening 
really have to be a little confused. They've got to be wondering, why would anybody want to use a solvent-thin product in the first place? Right, because we have water-based things now, and aren't those things better? Well, in a lot of ways, water-based products have advanced significantly, and they're great products, but there's still a place for traditional coatings. Right. Let's go over in the little bit that we've got left. Actually, we've got a fair amount left. That's fine. We've got a lot to cover. So (laughs) let's go over the pros Pros and cons cons of using traditional coatings. Now, first off, the pros, the really good stuff. Traditional coatings provide superior flow and leveling. Right. The paint or varnish, whichever it is, it'll stay wet for longer. Which which, sounds negative. Right. I think that we've gotten so used to being, you know. I want it now. I want it now. Yeah, it needs to be fast drying. I want to get done quickly. But really... That longer open time allows these products to self-level in a way that water-based products often cannot. It's really amazing, honestly. Yeah. You can brush an oil-based coating or, a, like you said, a polyurethane finish, a clear coat, brush it on. You see all the brush strokes. It looks terrible. You come back half hour later. It's They're starting gone. to self-level. Yeah. Right. And eventually, by the time it's dried, a lot of the times it can be almost glassy smooth. Exactly. It looks like that sprayed finish that we're all ultimately after, but with a lot less work. Yeah. And you're getting it because it's a traditional coating that allows for that. It dries slower, making that happen. Traditional coatings also can just be easier to use, not just produce better results, mm-hmm. but they're easier. And it, again, it's because it stays wet longer. Right. Now, think of it in this regard, a couple of different uh, examples, interior stains. There are water-based interior stains that are around, but in a lot of instances, they're just not terribly user-friendly. Right. And I don't think that they give you the same look either sometimes. You know, they stick in knots a little bit and you just don't get a nice finish. Right. The solvent-thinned interior stains, traditional stains that you're used to working with on wood, they're just crazy easy to work with. Right. You can screw them up. Yeah, you can. I, mean, I don't want to. You got to work at yeah, it. Yeah. But <laughs> if you're one of those people that just loves to find that way, there is a way. Yeah, <laughs> but it's much harder to screw them up. They just work really well. Deck stains, another yeah, situation. Example. It's almost exactly the same. Water-based deck stains exist, mm-hmm. and they can work really well, but they do dry really fast in hot weather, which is usually when we're doing the decks, and that can be problematic. Solvent-thin deck products. Again, really easy to work with. One of the easiest products out there to get great results with. Absolutely. So there's a couple of pros. They've got stain blocking superiority. Yeah, we just talked about this last week with Zip Prime. That's on sale right now. We've got, you know, a really nice, what is the base of that one? It's not an oil base. It's naphtha. Naphtha. So smellier yet. (laughs) A little bit smellier. (laughs) But. But it works. Right. Water-based stain blockers work Probably most of the time. Yes. You might have to put two coats on. Most of the time. But most of the time, you'll you'll get results from, you know, blocking out a water stain, a smoke stain. Tannin stains. Things like that. Solvent-thin stain blockers work every time. All the time. And you don't need multiple coats. One coat will do it. And why mess around with that? Like, just get results, right? Right. So that's where, again, traditional solvent-thin coatings really, really excel. They're the ideal option over existing solvent-thin products. Right. True. you've got oil-based products on your trim, Mm -hmm. you can switch. There's a method and and a process to get water-based coatings on that, and it will hold up fine. But traditional solvent-thin coatings are just a better route, an easier route. It's an easier route, exactly. You can just go right over that without thinking about it much, without going through a long process of making sure or worrying about the water-based coating sticking to that old element coating. So you've got that one last pro, great durability. Now, again, water-based Coatings have advanced significantly right. and can provide great durability. I'm thinking specifically about uh, my basement floor. I painted it with a urethane fortified floor paint, Repcolite's floor enamel. Yeah. And that thing wore like iron in my basement. I could drag, you know, the table saw across it <laughs> and it didn't do anything yeah, to that's it. It was amazing. like iron. And especially since most of the traffic down there is just foot traffic. Right. I mean, how often do you have a vehicle in your basement? <laughs> Not a big thing. Uh, it just held up like iron. At the next house, I put the water-based alternative down, Mm -hmm. and it's held up good, but it has not held up But you're not dragging your table saw across the floor No, I did once, but then (laughs) pulled the paint off, you know? Yeah. It's just not quite as durable in certain situations. All right, so there's some pros, but let's get to the cons, because those are kind of significant, too. First off, it's stinky. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing that we always think about with these oil-based products is that they just smell really bad, right? Yeah. But then the second point is that the smell or the fumes really could be dangerous ultimately. Right. And when we're talking about the dangerous fumes, we're not just talking about the stink because you can have odorless solvent-thin products. They exist. 
but they still have the fumes. Right. And if you're not ventilating, and in fact, sometimes people run run into issues on that because they think without the odor to mm-hmm. tip them off or the right, significant it's like odor, why they don't we, ventilate. It's why we put an odor in natural gas, right, so that we can smell it and know that there's a problem. When you don't smell anything, how would you know? Yeah, you're not going to know if the dog's there or not. If you can't <laughs> smell that one smell that they sometimes <laughs> do. But anyway, the bad smell tips you off. Yes. But in odorless products, the fumes are still there, even mm-hmm. though that smell isn't tipping you off. So you've got to make sure that you're ventilating well when you're using solvent-thin products. Absolutely. You've got to turn off pilot lights when you're working in areas where that exists. you just got to make sure you're keeping an eye on these things. You can mitigate these, right. these fume concerns. You just have to be proactive about it and exactly. really make sure the space is ventilated. So another con, the products yellow over time. Solvent-thin products just yellow. You're going to notice it in trim, you know, white trim, I'm mm-hmm. thinking. White cabinets. Exactly. You, now, you may not notice it living with it. Right, because you know, it's going to happen space. slowly over time. It, you just... Yeah. yeah. You you acclimate to it. But when you try to touch up or when you put yeah. you know, a new piece of trim in and you, you paint it, you realize how white the new stuff is versus how yellow the right. other is. It's just naturally going to happen. It yeah. happens with varnishes. And again, you probably don't notice it, but the varnishes will amber over time. Mm Solvent-thin varnishes will. Which can be really beautiful, actually. Well, most of the time, it is really beautiful. Right. But then again, you get a new piece of trim or something gets damaged, and lots of us have done that. Yeah, Yeah. you can't just put new down, put the old stain on, and put a new coat of clear over top Mm -hmm. and have it blend exactly. In a lot of instances... Now you're doing a custom match. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they will yellow over time. Keep that in mind. Another con, mineral spirits or another solvent, depending on what the base is, Mm -hmm. all of those things are going to be necessary for cleanup. Right. It's not as nice as just running a brush under the the faucet. You know, it's water cleanup is really nice in that way. And with solvents, it's... It's not really very fun. Now you've got a stinky product and you've got a stinky solvent to clean it up with. And on top of that, the last one, or maybe I guess I got two more cons, spontaneous combustion, which is a big con. That's a big con. (laughs) But when you're talking about cleaning up and getting, you know, rags damp with solvent, you've Mm got to make sure you take care of those rags appropriately, hang them on a clothesline to dry where you can spread them out, out, spread them out on the ground and let them dry. If you wad them up while they're wet, it's possible that enough heat could be generated that it could ignite. It happens, sounds crazy, but it really is a real concern. Finally, slow dry time. You know, we talked about that being a positive and it is. Yeah, it's also a negative because we do want to move quicker on projects in certain situations. We don't want to wait for the solvent thin products to dry down. Yeah. So with that said, why in the world would you use a solvent thin product? (laughs) We're right back to that, right? And there are again, a lot of big cons, but the answer is because, about. yeah, these things will do certain things that water based coatings just can't do. Yeah. All right. I guess we're about ready to wrap this up. We should mention Advance from Benjamin Moore. Yeah. I mean, because that really point. is a product that has its feet in both ponds a little bit, right? It's essentially an oil based product that's kind of wrapped in water because <laughs> yeah. you've got something that's low VOC, it's low odor, right? But then you've got it where it can brush out really nicely. It has that self-leveling, a little bit of a longer open time, but you still get water cleanup as long as you're doing it right away, and you don't have all of the mess of oil. Advance is one of the easiest products out there to work with to get great results. It's perfect for trim, cabinets. Stop out at any Repco Light and ask us about it. Benjamin Moore's Advance. Great product. All right. That's it, Haley. That's all the time we've got. We're going to wrap it up. We encourage you to get out there and check out Repco Light on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Every Twitter. Yeah. I'm tweeting all of them. or or X or whatever that is. I'm Xing. We all know it's Twitter. Yeah, I'm not good on well, so I'm honestly, you probably want to pay attention to what I'm doing. Because it's probably going to be pretty embarrassing. (laughs) So get there and check all those things out. We're throwing out lots of videos demonstrating a lot of the things that we talk about on the show. Right. And in a visual way where sometimes these things are a little bit easier to see than they are to hear. Yeah. And we're going to have some behind the scenes making of the show. All the flub ups that Haley has and yes, all the stuff. Flub ups. Yeah, all the stuff that people want. You can find those things on social media. And even more importantly, coming up in March, we're going to be launching a huge contest and you're going to want to be connected to us Absolutely. via all of those platforms, as many as possible. Just going to increase your odds. Yeah, you're going to learn more about that coming up later. All right, whatever you do today, have a great one. Make sure paint's a part of it. I'm Dan Hansen. I'm Haley Johnson. Thanks for listening.